Hello there. Um, welcome to my talk. Uh, it's titled FNICS, and that stands for Finding Needles in Haystacks and Chaotic Systems. So about myself, um, my name is Emmanuel Badeke. I'm building a RidgeTech Inc. Um, I'm a core contributor to the Go programming language. I'm an avid open source consumer and producer. Um, I'm always learning. I enjoy learning. I, yeah, that, that's what I thrive on, and I'm mostly self-taught. Um, I believe in always striving to do your best. Um, so this talk, this talk is about helping reduce complexity, uh, finding needles in haystacks, um, and in it we'll learn how to how we build from fundamentals until we get to com complex systems and then tame that complexity. Right. So to sweeten the talk, let's start with a really simple photo upload microservice. So this is a low budget Instagram, right? We don't have uh, filters, but we allow you to upload your photos. So um, right here, you could see we get web traffic. Uh, as we upload a photo, the first thing you want to do is authenticate. When a request hits your front end before you actually accept the image, um, you want to authenticate who the user is. And at that point, you might check your cache if you've authenticated them before, you know their credentials. If not, hit the MySQL database. Um, after you verified that they're authenticated, you then accept their photo upload, you send it to your cloud storage and return a response, right? This looks simple, true? Now, coming from that simplicity, we can get to this. And right there is an excerpt from um, a July 2020 blog post from Uber. Uh, and that shows the graph of their microservices. Right? Look, look at how, look at how crazy dense this is. These are very, very many microservices. Okay. The next one comes from our our friends Netflix. Um, as you could see, you as you can see, this graph is very dense, right? Like you could barely discern any anything. In fact, you couldn't discern anything, but this is what their microservices look like. And uh, that's how they talk to each other, okay? Um, the next one is also from a presentation from Netflix. And in there, they show how their microservices talk to each other, okay? So already, um, we started from a simple scenario, went to this. Uh, so these are exhibits of how, how fast complexity builds up. Now, what does this talk about? Firstly, we want to demystify what it takes to debug a system, a complex one, more over, without getting overwhelmed. You know, um, in our industry, there are so many terms that are thrown around. Um, it feels like there's so much to learn. There's, you know, there's so much unknown. In, uh, there's so much unknown information. But um, I believe, I believe uh, that in order to effectively build and manage your systems, you have to try to understand them and. In this talk, I'm going to try to help provide some tips on how to get to that, to that endpoint. Okay. Um, in this talk, you'll probably learn how to intelligently sift through indefinite search spaces of possibilities. If today I told you, hey, look, uh, I'm getting a 400 or an error, I just tell you vaguely, I'm having an error uploading my photos. Where do we start? What could go wrong? Right. Um, and if you have larger systems, you know, these, there are more states of disorder. So in this talk, perhaps you'll learn how to reduce entropy. And I believe you will learn, okay? And it's based off real world experiences um, that have been validated. Uh, the validated ideas that I'm presenting in here. Um, and I enjoy gladly sharing information. And this is information and tips that I've distilled from, I've spent ten, tens of thousands of hours building and debugging systems. And you get this information for free. Um, in this talk, I present ideas that could help with building towards anti-fragility. Anti-fragility is this concept of when your system is subjected to shocks, um, known, unknown, whichever, it should be able to recover from them, but also learn. So it shouldn't just be resilient, whereby, hey, you know, you give it shocks and it just blocks, it, it prevents those. You should be able to learn from those, right? You should. And, and so anyways, the tips in here will help with that. It'll help you with guiding and battling complexity and then war stories, like I mentioned. So 
let's uh, introduce fundamentals, right? Like I mentioned, every single system, uh, we always start from the basics. I showed that simple photo service, right? Um, that is equally true for every single thing you could think of. Uh, our, the human body is made up of cells. We start from the smallest indivisible, indivisible unit. And from that more, you know, the, there's an evolution that goes on more complex uh, systems, more complex units, and then eventually you build up this crazy big thing. Same thing with programming. We start with pieces of code, separated services, and then build upwards, okay? Um, and one thing we need to note is that technology is meant to return time into our hands and make us more productive. Um, however powerful your tools are, if they do not create a net benefit and reduce time, they reduce the cognitive overload for other developers, um, however nicely they're built and sophisticated, they don't return value, okay? And as I mentioned, as more features and business cases are developed, complexity compounds. And it, it would be a mistake not to acknowledge that we always stand on the shoulder of, shoulders of giants. Um, you know, their research, is, research has been done for years and years. We build off ideas that have been validated, new paradigms form, and we keep building from the lessons that we learned we're building more anti-fragile systems, right? And just remember that risk increases as complexity increases. That the more complex your program gets, the higher the risk of failure, right? And when one system fails, it could take down way more others, right? Like how many times do you see failures in cloud services when uh, like for example, AWS goes down, right? Half of the internet just goes down. In fact, could just be one region, okay? There are lots of dependencies, lack of a time systems, lack of redundancy, and obviously complexity, like I've talked about. So um, after, after that brief introduction, now let's get down to details. So the anatomy of a system, um, pretty much all programs that businesses run are meant to execute uh, some sort of business plan. So the software that is written executes the business logic or expresses ideas. Right? You want to express an idea and programming languages are what help you write, write uh, expression that then gets executed in a computer, thus executing your idea, right? There are frameworks. Now, in order for code to work, um, there are obviously function calls, right? Functions that you talk to each other. When you go from one service that talks to the other, uh, then we get to what's called inter-process communication, IPC, and um, a way to define the calls in IPCs to call them remote procedure, uh, remote procedure calls, RPCs, right? When components talk to each other is what, uh, what, what results is called the cardinality, number of connected elements and their relationships, okay? And to every system, uh, we've got CPU, RAM, hardware, network limits, you name it. Now, inherent in every system is chaos due to and fragility due to unknowns. Uh, we do not know, there are things that we do not know and don't anticipate, and those are what cripple our system. If we can't have the right, uh, the right tools to battle those unknowns, okay? So once you have an end process system, like if you have just two processes and they could talk to each other, um, one talks to the other, the other talks to the other. So those are two RPCs that you could have. If there are four, one of them talks to all three, and four times, so that's four times uh, times three, which is 12 unique RPCs. If 100, you do the math, comes to 9,900. Now, if it's 40,000 microservices, look at what that value gets to 1.6 billion RPCs, okay? Um, keep that in mind. And if you, if you recall the graphs that we looked at before, that's where we get such from. If we have N services and they all talk to each other, that's N times N minus one RPCs. And like I just showed, in a realistic system, you know, you're uploading that uh, from the low budget Instagram. You know, you need a login, you need an identity, quarter service, caching, database, metadata, storage, recommendations, pub sub, all these. And that's just in a very simple app, okay? So already if we have nine plus microservices, you can do the math and see that the RPCs just blow up, right? So scenarios, let me sweeten the deal a bit. Most of us are aware of uh, Pokemon Go, which was made by a company called Niantic um, 
in 2016. In 2016, they planned for their launch. They anticipated 5 million, 5 million users, right? But actually, the, uh, the app went viral and they got 50 million users, so 10 times anticipated traffic. If, if you all remember, during that time, every time you'd load up their app, it would be crashing, it would be crashing, okay? And we have to note that even the most talented engineers hit walls when debugging complex interactions. And I will show scenarios. I'll show you, uh, I'll take you through some war stories. And remember high entropy, right? Like most of our world is largely undiscovered. Um, we are very lucky to be where we are. Uh, so and every advancement that gets made helps reduce the number of unknowns and help us and helps us survive even more, right? And the, uh, the crazy thing is that even today with all these highly respected engineering titans, you know, the big names, when they get um, a ticket, they route that pretty much through a call center, right? There'll be someone who receives it. There'll be like a cloud solution engineer who triages that, then assigns it to someone in their team to look at if they could read through and find an answer in the FAQs, after FAQs, uh, technical solutions, and they route that until it goes down to a chain of engineering. By that time, the amount of co uh, context that has been lost is insane, right? And then when you get cascading failures, you go on wild, good ch wild goose chases. You do not know exactly what's going on. So first case study, um, DGraph. Now, DGraph are the hosts of uh, this conference. They've been gracious enough to invite me. Thank you very much. Now, in 2018, um, DGraph, uh, was trying to get their consensus protocol, basically their system validated by uh, Jepson, right? Jepson, what Jepson does is it helps test uh, distributed systems and actually give a report on what fails and that kind of thing. So Jepson is like, it's a prized, it's a prized test that most distributed systems want to pass to you know, be respected and certified. Now, um, to give you a bit of context, they were struggling for months to figure out why their tests weren't passing. They were just failing, failing months and months. To give you context, uh, DGraph's uh, engineering team and you know the whole company, they're, they're very highly, you know, they're highly skilled people, right? They've worked in Google search or knowledge graph. They've built crazy systems. So, you know, we're not just saying, hey, you know, they were struggling because they weren't skilled. They're actually had spent, you know, they have, uh, they have the experience for it. So I, I presented a talk at uh, GoSF, Go San Francisco at Samsara um, in July, 2018. And at my talk was the CEO of DGraph, Manish Jain. Um, so right after my talk, as I was going back to uh, slide my laptop into my backpack, he came by, told me, hey, I think your ideas could help us out. We exchanged contacts, I shared my slides. Um, two weeks after that, we got in touch, uh, had video calls, explained to me the problems that were going on. I sent him more information on how to use Open Census, which I was building, uh, how to use Open Census, integrating into their app. And within hours, um, and he has written about this actually in the DGraph blog, within hours of deciding Open Census, he found out exactly what was going on, right? So what was happening was that there, uh, their consensus protocol, which uses Raft. First, DGraph is uh, being a distributed graph database, um, horizontally scalable. All those nodes need to talk to each other, right? And they need to they need to talk to each other, and always decide, hey, what's you know what's the final commit? What's our final state? So their Raft protocol was they were getting reproposals like. Uh, Reproposals that were timing out, and they didn't know why. But by applying observability, they're able to get that shed. Okay, so Manish was very happy that all that got sorted out. You know, I basically we basically were I was basically his Geico lizard. You know, fifteen minutes could save you fifteen percent. So I mean, hours of just applying it uh, saved them the months and months that they'd spend banging themselves in the wall. So. Right after that, um, they were excited about Open Census. Um, they asked me for help to add more integrations. And you know, that Thanksgiving, um, I volunteered and pro bono went in, spent two days at their office, helped them integrate Open Census in their code, answered every single question they had, and they were very happy. So 
check this out. Um, in fact, they took me out uh, for Thanksgiving lunch. Uh, you know, instead of a turkey, we had uh, tacos. So that was exciting. Made new friends, go to company happy, solved uh, hard distributed problems for them using observability. Now, this was his later testimonial, which uh, is right there. You'll see it in my slides. Um, but he highlighted the point of my talk. You know, um, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack with OC being open census, acting like a powerful magnet, right? So from that crazy universe of uh, possibilities of months of months of sweating by applying observability, was able to get an answer ASAP, right? Right, so uh, now coming back to the concepts world and presenting what the problems could be, you could get a barrage of uh, cascading failures just happening so fast, right? If you have a really modest service and let's say 5,000 people in the whole world are using your photo app um, and it's scaled over 10 instances or yeah, 10 instances or so, you know, in a week that could produce one point, almost 1.2 terabytes of data a week, right? Just from spans alone. Now, what happens when your service hits 40,000 QPS, right? That value just blows up, okay? At any point, you do not know the health of your system, what's going wrong. Could there be security issues, network saturation, resource saturation, you've run out of file descriptors, how do you know, right? Could it be a seasonal problem? Like, you know, it's Thanksgiving and everyone suddenly discovers, hey, you know, we wanna order Ubers or uh, St. Patrick's Day, folks are getting wasted, they can't drive. They all wanna order uh, Lyfts or Uber, right? Um, debugging after a failure always has a problem that you've always lost the information. Unless we invent time travel, there's no way to recreate scenarios that led to problems. So what you need is a proactive way of going through, okay? The time you spend debugging and sweating with problems, that's time not spent executing your business model or improving your culture, company culture, right? You, you always wanna build your employees, you wanna ensure everyone is doing well, everyone is treated fairly, right? Chaos erupts within uh, engineering divisions, no one knows what's going wrong, right? Lost reputation, negative press, pressure on your employees and shareholders. And some of these problems come from the inability to apply fundamentals, right? Um, remember, we start with small systems. If we can tame the small systems as they grow bigger and we can also tame those, things get a lot better, right? Um, so many unknowns and even unknown unknowns, right? Um, so observability, like I mentioned, which is what helped manage, if you recall. Um, the idea is you infer the states of a system by examining specific signals, right? And in, if you think about this in linear algebra, you model a system as a, you know, as a form of equations with variables expressing the states. If it's linearly solvable, you know what's going on. And observability, you could think of, to make it more relatable, you go to a doctor. The first thing that happens when you get to a doctor is they ask for tests, uh, blood pressure, uh, you know, hearing tests, weight. Um, they could even ask for blood tests and all these. So they, they get critical signals. They check for your heart, heart rhythms and all these things. They compile critical signals then use those to correlate with the problems you're saying uh, that you've raised to them. Then they make a prognosis, do further tests, then give you a diagnosis. So that's pretty much how observability will help. Take a look at open census, open telemetry. And even after identifying those uh, signals, don't just take them off and say, hey, you know what? We have traces, metrics, logs. No, actually go find a great APM provider and let them help you out. And most important, use instrumented libraries and integrations. We've created a bunch of those. Um, this was actually an excerpt from the code that I presented that convinced Manish, hey, you know what? Maybe we should care about uh, open census, right? And this was the aftermath. You'll, you, know, you can, uh, this image might be fuzzy uh, looking, looking at it from the outside, but I'll provide slides. Um, so traces metrics are present. Another case study was uh, we suddenly got this very odd issue. An integration test was failing. No one could really figure out why. Um, and this was code that had been per running perfectly, right? But all of a sudden it would crash. Um, so uh, the team pinged me, they're like, oh, we need, we, have, we need help with this, something's going wrong. And you, know, you can't blame Cosmic Rays for this, right? 
Um, so I made, I made a friend who works in Google Cloud Storage. Um, I hit him up one day after lunch, walked over to his building. We sat down in a, in a room with a whiteboard, started sketching through. Um, we ran the integration testing loops, but in order for us to figure out what exactly was getting sent to intelligently debug, um, I applied a trick, which I know from working on the net HTTP package. We have environmental variables. We have go debug is equal to HTTP debug is equal to which shows you what is getting sent on the line, right? So you know what's going on the wire. And guess what? Um, after that correlation read through pretty much all the code, we grabbed all the trace context identifiers, you know, looked at, looked at the traces, you know, they, uh, there's a way to like correlate and figure out how, what services were touched. After that, I started noticing in the logs that content type null would crash tests. And so after I caught that we grab, we purposefully started sending content, content type is equal to now. And it turned out that I knew there was a rewrite for a, one of the services internally. We we're doing it in C++, but unfortunately uh, in that code, they assumed that content type would be a string that was not null. By specifying now, it took down an entire service. So we filed, it was an embarrassing bug. We filed, uh, you know, we filed it. There was a bit of a code freeze and reliability engineering got happy and I tagged the issue. Um, so when, once you have systems that are operating, you know, once, once your app gets very popular, right? Right now, this code, is, you know, if you're streaming, say for example, on YouTube Live or Zoom uh, and you get, or Twitch, right? You get you get a whole lot of visitors. Um, you're getting so much data flowing in. You can't reply, sorry, you can't analyze that manually in a timely fashion, right? When disaster strikes, it's very expensive. You need very robust tools. There's so much that could go wrong. So you go on wild goose, wild goose chases. You're like, oh, did the service fail? No, nope, it didn't. But by then you've burned two hours, right? Um, so, you know, unknowns and many unknown unknowns, as uh, Donald Rumsfeld famously said, um, so this, this part is about reducing that risk of uh, actually combating the problem of you have um, too many, you know, too much data flowing in, just a barrage of data. Um, and right now, in order to do sampling, sorry, in order to, in order to perform uh, distributed tracing, what happens is most traces are sampled, but there is a very primitive way of sampling, which if you look into open census, open telemetry, you'll see it's like, head-based sampling, just basically you, you toss a coin. If it lands on heads, you let that through. If it doesn't, no. There's so many problems with that. If you have a sudden event, you've lost critical data, right? If PS5 sales kick off, your e-commerce site is it's just going down, right? And you won't even know what happened. So, but can we do better, right? Can we do better with all that information that comes in? Can we isolate what could be going wrong? What we really, really care about, right? Because we can't sift manually through, you know, petabytes of data as a human being. There's a huge cognitive overload, right? So um, remember I mentioned life is built of, uh, you know, work that others have done. We stand on the shoulders of giants. So Alan Turing, um, Alan Turing, proved what was called the CLT, Central Limit Theorem. Uh, and he, I mean, it was discovered a couple of years before, but um, he actually proved it in, his thesis, in a thesis that earned him a fellowship uh, at King's College in Cambridge, which was remarkable. You know, this guy was amazing, but even as a bachelor's student, he, you know, he did great work. And if you've ever gotten graded on a bell curve, ranked or any of that, that's him, that's his work. So that proof, what it did was that it correlated the uh, randomness with normal distributions. So basically it showed that if however random events were over time, they will form into a normal distribution. And what that means then is that we can apply techniques that are used for normal distributions to sift through data that I'll show shortly. Um, but I mean, you also need uh, you know, there are caveats to these things. You just can't apply them blindly. Make sure, you know, it has to fit within normal distribution and you can apply techniques. And like I mentioned, you stand on the shoulders of giants. So there's what's called the three sigma rule. And it's very simple, right? Uh, my goal is always to ensure that things are simple. 
three sigma rule says, hey, if you have a normal distribution, um, you can extract the mean, right? And the mean is really simple. It's a simple formula. Um, you add up quantities and divide by the number of elements. Then from there, you also generate what a um, discrete uh, values like the variance, right? So what it states is that in a normal distribution, 99.7% of the values aren't, you can just chuck them out, right? So now if you have petabytes of data and 99.7% of those are useless, boom, we have a win right there, right? Um, these, if, if data exceeds uh, the predetermined limits, these ones that I show, uh, then you know those are anomalies and that's what you care about. So we now have a solution to dealing with so much data. And here I show some code that's actually from services that we use. Um, then here is another story which highlights the need for us to ensure that we understand and can finesse and play around with the systems that we have. There was a bug report filed in February, um, February of this year. Uh, it, it was assigned to me two months later. Uh, and, you know, I, I got that bug report in the morning. I went, you know, I came in, uh, worked on some stuff. After lunch, I looked at I looked at the bug report, went to my whiteboard behind me, um, sketched out some ideas. And in 30 minutes, I produced a seed um, using knowledge about having, you know, net HTTP. And that knowledge I am passing on to you. Um, it's available in guides that I've provided, that I'll provide with these slides. So my point being here that uh, in order to solve complex problems, look, this is two months after a complex bug had been filed. It was a problem with um, decompressive, uh, so it was a problem with, with gzip, you know, decompressive transcoding. So files that was gzip served back, uh, and the go pro, uh, the go library was supposed to decompress them. Yet somehow they passed in a range header which was wrong. But you find that I actually went through a you know uh, I, I walked through fundamentals, walked uh, examined what was going wrong, and within less than thirty six hours there was a fix. It was up. Customer was happy. So there come my recommendations uh, to sift through and find needles in haystacks, learn how to navigate and finesse your systems, spend time, um, organize drills for your team, uh, collect as much relevant information, reduce that entropy, right? Reduce uncertainty as much as you can. And in here, I provide some guides. And then another case study, uh, this one is for the Go project. All of a sudden, a test that required a max of 50 threads started to fail. Um, and this one is super interesting. Uh, I'm running out of time, but uh, what it boiled down to was that we had a regression while moving system calls from a new library uh, in, on Darwin, like what max run on. Um, after a long haul flight, I rushed directly to my office, went in my whiteboard, spent hours modeling the system, figured out that it was, uh, the performance was very linear. And it turned out that in that rewrite, uh, there was an a, a, a single typo, change the assembly instructions to always spawn a thread. Yet with Go, what we do is uh, we, we don't use a thread until um, a file descriptor is ready for reading, right? So walk through that um, and model the system. And then someone actually submitted a fix later on independently. But helping me understand that required me to understand what my, you know, the components of my system that kind of thing. So then also to do that, I perform continuous profiling, which basically involves, um, the way it works is it's conceptually it's simple. So normal CPUs run at uh, predetermined frequencies like 2.5 gigahertz. When I say 2.5 gigahertz, which if you look at your computers everywhere, you'll see that kind of speed, 2.5, 3.6. It means it runs 5 billion times a second, right? Now, if uh, the way profiling works is a signal is sent to a program and it's stopped a hundred times a second. So, I mean, if it's running 2.5 billion times a second, stopping it a hundred times isn't too bad, right? And after, once it stops, you ask, hey, where am I spending most of my time? Where am I spending most of my memory? And that actually gives you a glimpse of what could be going wrong, okay? Um, and profiling is profound in that things that you could never catch during uh, code reviews will actually be surfaced, right? Um, 
So instead of trying to guess, spending time figuring out what to optimize, just look at profiles. They'll show you exactly what's going wrong. Cut down your complexity by far. Right? And in here, I show code that you could copy and paste and use to profile. Um, and I show an alternative right there using net HTTP PPBROF and a result. You'll be able to see this in here. You get to see where most of the time is spent. And that's a code we want to optimize. Um, same thing for memory profiling, exact same code, different result in that it shows you where your memory is hogged up, aka your RAM. Um, so in conclusion, my advisory here is that you find needles in haystacks, get proficient with your packages, right? Um, understand the systems you're playing with. I've shown the cases whereby knowing how to finesse NetHDP actually paid off to cut down complexity by far instead of months. This was in less than hours. And those hours uh, involved me waiting. Uh, and here I was uh, debugging a very complex system, okay? Learn to use some flags like go debug is equal to HTTP2 debug is equal to two. That saved us a whole lot. Learn about gRPC interceptors. Um, look at observability, open sense and open telemetry. Look at continuous profiling. Um, and if you're interested, hit me up. Uh, we have a product that's coming up. Hashtag shameless plug. <laughs> um, anomaly detection and intelligence sampling. Ask your APM providers. If they don't, hit me up. Sorry for sorry for the plugging. Um, use logs. Ensure you have trace propagation. Look at mock servers. Read through HTTP test. Learn about runtime tracing. Attention to detail in bug reports and fuzzing. I didn't mention fuzzing, but it's what would have helped. Uh, the prior failure of content content type is equal to now where that server crashed just from that. And uh, I, I provide references here, which would be useful for a read. But my point stands that using simple fundamentals, you can tackle a whole lot of very hard problems. Okay. And these are my references. And thank you very much.